we shall continue our discussion on some additional features of C++ programming language. Today and tomorrow, we wish to cover functions and arrays. We'll be introducing arrays tomorrow. But today, we wish to look at functions. I'll briefly review the last lecture, primarily to repeat some of the instructions. One slide I could not show you yesterday. And then we will talk about the need to segment our program into multiple modules so that programs are organized better and the code or instructions which we write are understandable more easily. It is in this context that we shall discuss functions. So first about yesterday's lecture, a brief review. Specifically, we discussed aspects of conditional execution and iterative and repetitive execution of instructions. So we discussed the if, if else, these two clauses for conditional execution of statements. And we discussed the ladder, if, else if, else if, etc., etc. We also discussed the for loop and the while loop to construct iterative instruction execution. We also discussed a couple of programs which carry out important numerical computations. We discussed the Fibonacci numbers or the Hemchandra numbers as I prefer to call them and the newton raphson method for finding out roots. We specifically took a simple quadratic and tried to solve the roots in an iterative fashion. We found out that we can get only one root by that method as we saw it yesterday. These are the few slides which I would like to repeat again. The evaluation approach, we have 10% marks for quizzes, 10% for the assignments, you have your first assignment, which is actually called assignment two, because it is associated with lab two. Every lab will now have an associated assignment, which you will have to finally submit within the week. Ideally, you should finish off the assignment there itself, but some of the problems are indeed difficult. It is not expected that you should be able to solve all problems during that lab. But what is definitely expected is you try as much as you can, plus you take the remaining thing back home and work on those exercises. Subsequently, in any spare time, you could upload your final assignment. All the assignments together will constitute a 10% weightage in this course. Then I said we'll have a course project. Ideally, there should be a group of four students. So either three or five students would be permitted as an exception only for one group in a batch. The groups must come from your lab batches. Mid-semester exam, which will be a written exam, will be 20% weightage, and the end semester exam will be 30% weightage. And as I described, the minimum passing grade will be 40%. There are additional consulting supports that we have been able to provide. There are teaching assistants specifically designated as consulting TAs. They will attend office on Monday and Tuesday in two batches from 13.30 to 17.30, that is four hours. There will be two sort of separate groups and another four hours on Tuesday. So in case you are free on any one of these afternoons, you are free to use the lab and these TAs will be available to answer any queries that you have or solve your problems of not just the lectures, labs and programming problems, but even other administrative problems. The additional hours for lab access are available on both these days. I am additionally trying to get uh, a slot on Thursday, but I am not sure of that. I will confirm it with my head and the administration, and you will find the announcement on the Moodle and on the home page. So with this, we go over to the notion of separate functions. So there are occasions in a program where we are required to do very similar computations using different values. So let's assume that we have a very long program, 200 line program, and we are calculating something at one place after some instructions. Again, similar calculations have to be done, perhaps using different values. 
after some time again similar calculations have to be done now these calculations may involve a single statement may involve 20 statement so it looks very silly to have to repeat these 20 statements every time we have to carry out the similar calculation because they may occur at different points in the program so we look forward to a mechanism by which we could sort of separate out this common block of code so to say incidentally code and instructions are considered synonymous so when we say you have written instructions in a program or you have written a program we also say what is the code in your program so these are synonymous so we would like to take this pack of instructions and put them separately as a separate entity and we should be able to say in our program okay at this time I want to evaluate that particular thing so go over to that separate package do the calculations using the values which I supply and come back to me. That essentially is the notion of a function. For example, in yesterday's uh, problems that we saw, uh, the newton raphson method, we had to calculate fx and f dash x for different values of x. In that particular program, these computations occurred at a single place within an iteration. But I'm trying to generalize that if you have to do such calculations at different places, it would be nice if the calculation of fx and f dash x could be separated out. In fact, then you could write the main program to calculate the root by Newton Raphson. And if you have to do it with different functions, you can simply replace the instructions for such separately written function and the same program will work. That's another advantage of having common functions. Such functions, in fact, will ultimately become what we call library of functions. Just as library has a lot of books, our library could have a lot of functions accumulated. As we shall see later, people have already written a lot of useful functions which have been made part of C++ Dumbo's repertoire. Additionally, in our programs, we can write our own functions. So we shall see how we do that. This is what we were trying to do. Given xi to calculate the next value of xi plus 1, so we started with some initial assumption of xi and we know this is the point A. Since this is the initial assumption, we know the value of the coordinates xi comma 0. Then we said we'll find out the function value and calculate the point B which is here. The coordinates of point B will be xi comma y value which is this value and this is nothing but the value of the function. So xi comma fxi will be this value we said. Then we said we will approximate the next iteration value of xi by using a tangent on this graph at point B. And wherever this tangent intersects x axis, we said that will be our new point for the next iteration. So we have to calculate the intercept on x axis, which is C. And we, we say that C is xi plus 1 comma 0. The issue was how do we calculate xi plus 1? Knowing xi, how do we calculate xi plus? So knowing xi, we can calculate the coordinates for b. Then we can calculate the slope of this line. And then we can calculate the intercept. This was given by a function calculation of this type. f dash xi is fxi upon xi minus xi plus 1, which implies that xi plus 1 is nothing but xi minus f of xi divided by f dash xi. So this simple formulation permits us to calculate the next iteration value. We go closer to the root. And the calculation of this value requires us to evaluate this function at a point xi and its derivative at the point xi. But this we have to do repeatedly till we approach the root. Now we had written specific instructions to calculate this fx and fx f dash x assuming that the quadratic was simple x square minus k or some such thing. But imagine if in general I have a quadratic fx is equal to ax square plus bx plus c. I'm just taking this as an example. In actual practice it could be any complex function requiring a whole lot of computations also. It doesn't matter. In this particular case f dash x will be 2ax minus b uh, plus b. So what we're saying is it would be nice if we had separate blocks of instructions to calculate fx and calculate f dash x. A function in C++ is indeed such a separate block. What that function does is, 
you imagine that function to be a, a separate entity. So whenever our Mr. Dumbo goes to that function, it takes with it, with himself, some value. In this case, it will take the value of A, B, C, and X, for example. And that function will calculate the value of the function, and Dumbo will collect it back. So we need a mechanism for Dumbo to leave whatever instructions he is executing, to go to that function, come back with the value. Again, if you encounter that function, Dumbo should again go back to that function and come back. How exactly are such functions written? Here is an example. So I have float my function. Let's just read these lines and then we'll understand the meaning of these. The first line says float my function and in this parenthesis it has float a comma float b comma float c comma float x. Then the body of the function is written very much like you write int main except that in a function generally there will be no input output statement. The input to that function will be the parameter values which Dumbo will carry. And the output of that function will be a value which will be returned by that function to Mr. Dumbo. So you see the calculations, how they are happening. You start by declaring a variable called value. It's an arbitrary name, my choice. Similarly, this name is my choice. That's why I said my function. It could be abracadabra, abraka, any meaningful name that you can give. All that I do here is value equal to a into x into x plus b into x plus c. Note that this is the function. Where does this fellow get the values for a, x, b, c, etc.? These values will come to this function as to what kind of these values are is defined in this parenthesis by listing each and every parameter separately along with the type of value that the parameter represents. So some of the values will come and sit into these buckets, A, B, C, X. And then these values will be used by Dumbo. Let's say he is an assistant Dumbo for this function. to Calculate this value. Note the statement, return in bracket value. Do you recall return zero as a mandatory statement that we have been writing in our programs? You will recall that our programs begin with int main. Actually, that itself is a function. That is called the main function. And it returns an arbitrary value 0. We shall see what is the meaning of that. In this particular case, the value returned will be 1 which is computed here. I have written another function to calculate the derivative of the quadratic, which I define as float my derivative, float a, float b, float x. Note the derivative requires only these three parameters. It will again, I am defining a float value, value equal to 2ax plus b, return value. Let's look at some possible confusion. I am using value in this function definition. I am also using value in this function definition. Is there any clash? No. If you imagine each function to be assigned to a separate assistant Dumbo, then for that assistant Dumbo, the definition of variables inside that function are localized to that Dumbo. So those definitions do not correspond to anything that we define in our main program. They are local definitions. In short, the assistant Dumbo will then create a compartment or a drawer called value. We'll know that floating point values are to be kept inside it. It will calculate that value, return that value, and then you forget about that drawer and Dumbo everything. In short, this value and this value are two completely different variable names. They are in different spaces. You remember namespace, using namespace STD. That was the major namespace for Dumbo. In exactly the same way, there are local namespaces for assistant Dumbos, which we create. Now, if we write these two functions, we must know how to invoke these. How do we use these functions in our main program? So these functions are understood. There is a keyword called float. What does this float say? Why I'm saying float? Why not int? This represents the value which is returned by this function, the type of value. If we say int, it will return an integer value. If we say float, it will return a floating point value. So whatever type of value you want to return, that type is mentioned here as the first word. This is followed by the name of the function, which is your choice. 
and this is followed by one or more parameters which will come to this function from somewhere using those parameters and any other internal things that the function may desire. Please note that we have said there should be no input output st statement inside a function normally, but there is no bar on it. I can read any values, I can read from uh, files as we shall see later, I can do whatever I want because that function is a full-fledged program, it's a C++ program, but it is self-contained. After executing this function, the value returned will be whatever I write inside the bracket. This bracket need not contain a variable name. It can contain a constant value as we saw earlier in the main program, return zero. It can also contain an expression. In fact, it is entirely possible not to say float value, not to say value equal to this, but to simply say return in bracket a into x into x plus b into x plus c, bracket close. Because that becomes the expression which will be evaluated by this function and the resulting value will be returned. So you can simplify it. I am writing this to elaborate that normally functions should be written in this type. This is a simple case where you have a single statement, but ordinarily you could have 10, 20, 30 statements, instructions comprising a function domain. So is it clear this is another function which is written exactly similarly, which is called my derivative. So you are clear on the definition of these two functions. Now we shall see how we could use these. First of all, some rules. Suppose I say int my function float something something. This int will define the type of the value that will be returned. So obviously for numerical computations of the values of function and derivatives, I would like to use floating point value. That is why in the actual definition I have used the keyword float, not int. So float my function. This will be followed by int x, float y, double c, whatever, whatever, any number of parameters. These are the values which will come into the function. So after the keyword int or float, the next is the name of the function which we choose. Entirely is our choice. This is followed by one or more parameters whose values will come from the calling instruction. And note the return statement. This says what value is to be sent back. So inside the parenthesis after return, you write the value which will go back. Again, I will repeat that value. Let's go back to the previous slide. This value could be either a constant, 0, 1, 7.28, or it could be a variable. In general, it can be any expression. That expression will be evaluated. Whatever is the return value, whatever is the calculated value, that will become the return value. So let's go to the next slide and see this function in the context of our Dumbo model. As far as we are concerned, our computer is a Dumbo, but we have been calling him C++ Dumbo. In actual practice, if we want to abstract the computer by a model comprising a Dumbo, then we must imagine several assistant Dumbos. In fact, when we say C in and C out, instructing Dumbo to get some values, put some values out, we are actually saying in an abstract fashion as if the C++ has an assistant number which does input output. In exactly the same fashion, we can imagine that every function is a separate assistant number. So the way things operate is that any time a function is invoked within an instruction which C++ number is executing, we shall see how the function can be invoked. We have not yet seen that. But apparently there is a mechanism that in my main program, I should be able to say something which will tell Dumbo that I don't have to compute this but this is a function invocation, so I have to go to this assistant Dumbo. So whenever this invocation happens, Dumbo will collect the parameters which are listed in that invocation and go over to the assistant Dumbo giving him the parameter. It is the separate assistant Dumbo then who calculates the function value and returns the final value to Dumbo. Once Dumbo gets back the final value, he carries on using that return value from wherever he left, exactly at that point he comes back. So let us look at the invocation of these functions. Within a program, his function is invoked simply by using the function name with appropriate parameters within any expression. 
they should be underlined within any expression. So wherever I can write an expression, any complex expression, just as I write uh, 3.75 multiplied by Z divided by Q, whatever, whatever, in that expression, an element of that expression could be a function invocation. Please note that a function really stands for a single value which will be returned by that assistant number. Since a value can participate in the evaluation of an expression, wherever a value can be given, instead of that, a function reference can be made. In the newton raphson method, we have some value xi, and we calculate the next value using this formula. xi plus 1 is xi minus f of xi divided by f dash xi. We saw that briefly once again. So suppose our function was fx is equal to ax square plus bx plus c. You will realize that the two functions that we have written precisely calculate fx, which is ax square plus bx plus c, and f dash x, the corresponding derivative. So my function and my derivative are the two functions or two assistant numbers which we have written, which can be used to do this calculation. Using this function, how will I write my program? Let us look at one variation of that program, which actually carried out 10 iterations arbitrarily, starting with an initial value of 1.0 and going to successive values of x using the function and its derivative. So here is the newton raphson using function calls. We have include IO stream using namespace std, int main, bracket close, bracket open, bracket close. What I would like to emphasize here is now perhaps we understand to some extent the meaning of this line. This line which says int main bracket open bracket close. It tells us that this is also probably some kind of a function. It is called main because that appears to be the main function which our C++ number will execute. It is expected to return a value of the type int and it does not have any parameter. Now, if Mr. Dumbo, C++ Dumbo is going to execute this as our main program, whom does he return the value to? Assistant Dumbo will return values to Mr. Dumbo. Mr. Dumbo returns to whom? So actually, Mr. Dumbo returns these values to what we call an operating system, which originally gives Mr. Dumbo the task of executing our program. We shall see that in due course of time. But it is adequate to say at this stage, that the main program itself is a function without any parameters. It may, in fact, either have a return value or may not have any return value. If there is no return value to the main function, you write the word void. Void, void means the function does not return any value. It's just a function, execute it. Just come back and tell me whether you are done or not. Anyway, let's go back to our task. So this is the main program. All of you are familiar with this. Here I have defined x, a, b, c as floating point uh, variables. Also value root. I am saying c out, enter values of a, b, c, and then I input a, b, and c. And I start with an initial guess of 1.0. This is the initial guess for x. Now I say for int i equal to 0, semicolon, i less than 10, semicolon, i plus plus. What does this for instruction do? It sets up an iteration which will be executed 10 times. Initially for i equal to 0, then for i equal to 1, then for i equal to 2, etc. up to and including i equal to 9. When i becomes 10, I will get out of this iteration. And what am I doing in this iteration? I am merely calculating the next value of x using the previous value of x. Note the notion of increment. There exists a value of x, initial guess, 1.0. I'll probably get 1.8 or 0.5, whatever it is, okay, depending upon the nature of the function. This value is to be obtained not by evaluating directly the formula that I give here, but by invoking first my function and then invoking another function, my derivative. So remember what our Dumbo will do. Our Dumbo now starts executing this loop. For the first time it comes in with i equal to 0. It has a value x which is 1.0. It starts evaluating this expression. 
it notices x, it replaces it by 1.0. Then it says minus sign. Now it has to find out what is to be subtracted. Then it finds out, oh, what is to be subtracted is not known. So I have to go to assistant Dumbo, who is called my function. And I have to carry the values of a, b, c, and x with me. Notice that all these values have been initialized already. So they are available. Dumbo will actually carry these values, go to my function. My function will calculate that ax square plus bx plus c. And then it will come back with what? With a single value. So please remember, any reference to a function will always come back with a single value. It is that value which Dumbo will replace for my function reference. So let's say that value is whatever, 7.8, something. The matter doesn't end here. Dumbo cannot subtract 7.8 from x because it notices a division symbol. And notice the precedence. Multiplication and division has to be done before addition and subtraction. So it knows that this 7.8 value that it has got has to be divided by something else and then the final result has to be subtracted from it. So what is that something else? Dumbo again encounters another function. This time he says my derivative. He goes to another assistant Dumbo called my derivative. This time carrying only three values, a, b and x, because they are sufficient. And with these values it goes, it calculates, and the value is returned. I calculate all this iteratively, x will keep going closer to the root, and at the end of the iteration, after 10 iterations, say, when I come out, I will have one value of x, which should be the root. Notionally, I am assigning it to root, and then printing out the root. In fact, that brings us to an important point. The names of the variables that you choose in your program should always be meaningful. Should never have arbitrary names like A1, A2, A3, A4, etc. etc. The names of the programs that you write, which you store in some files called C .cpp, the names also should be meaningful. They should not be P1, P2, P3. You will observe that in the lab exercises, we have programs which are called prototype.cpp, etc. So something of that sort you should use in any naming convention. These are the invocation rules. If I, I have written here the expression for my benefit. And once again I repeat, when Dumbo encounters my function while evaluating this expression, it suspends execution of the program. At this stage, that program execution stops. No instruction is executed in that program. Goes over to the defined function with the available values of the parameters, a, b, c, and x in this case. That assistant number or the function will calculate the value executing the instructions given in that function. Please note again, in our functions here, there are simple instructions, but there could be 20, 30, 100, 2000 instructions, doesn't matter. It's an assistant number separate. But all of that must result in a single value which is brought back. Later on we shall see that if I want to write procedures which will return back not one value but many values, how can I handle that? Because the notion is same, that of a function. Well, we shall see that when we extend the notion of function to return multiple values. Obviously that cannot be done through a return statement. There must be some other mechanism. We shall see those later. As of now, the return statement will get the value which is calculated by that function and then when Dumbo returns back to the main program, he replaces the reference to the function by the return value. This entire reference, my function ABCX, is written by a sing, uh, replaced by a single value, 3.2, 4.8, whatever, whatever. And then same thing happens again for this, this is also replaced by a single value and finally the whole expression is calculated, resulting in a new value of x. So is this notion clear? Now I wanted to use some time to explain to you because I saw some people were still having problems with the instructions that you are required to give while working in your labs. I also wanted to do this exercise of finding out roots of a quadratic through a completely different means because all of you will know the standard way of calculating the two roots of a quadratic equation. All of you are familiar with that? So let's start with 
that approach, we will ditch the newton raphson method. In the lab, of course, you have to use newton raphson method to find out the three roots of a cubic, etc. But here, if I have a quadratic of this form, what are the two roots? Assume that this quadratic has two real roots, which means what? Ultimately, this should be of the form x minus r1 multiplied by x minus r2 equal to 0. You agree? If I have two roots r1 and r2, this is how I will write the equation. And essentially, I want to find out the values of r1 and r2 given the values of a, b, and c. So what is the formula to calculate these roots? Minus b plus minus ah, so you are awake. Now, why do I require newton raphson method to calculate this? Can I not calculate this using my if ladder? Can I not calculate b square minus 4ac? How will I calculate its square root? Do I use newton raphson method? I can, but there may be a better way of doing that. And if I can calculate the square root easily, then I can calculate the entire expression, calculate R1 and calculate R2. So let us write a program to do that. You are all familiar with this basic form of equation. So I will start directly by saying So what are the variables which I will require? I will require, of course, A, B, C, which are the three parameters. And then I will require R1, R2. I suppose this should be good enough. But since I have to calculate the square root of B square minus 4AC, and since there is a mathematical name for that entity, what is it called? Discriminant. So let us just call it DISCR for short. Discriminant. What should I get in as values? Of course, you should write the necessary C out by saying, give me the values of A, B, C, etc. We take that for granted. So you got the values in. Now I should calculate the discriminant. First, what? I have calculated b square minus 4ac. How do I calculate the square root? Right now, we do not know it. The only way to calculate the square root is using newton raphson method. So assume that I have written a function called my square root. Now you know how to write a function? So I can write my square root. 
which will do the exact newton raphson method for calculating the square root and you'll get me the value back so i call it my sqrt please note that my sqrt doesn't exist unless i write float function my sqrt float a float b float c and then calculate this value using this value i calculate the square root and return back with that square root once i have the square root i have to calculate two different roots please note that in c++ there is nothing like an algebraic notation which says minus b plus minus you can't say plus minus it does not no expression calculates two values simultaneously you can't say r1 comma r2 equal to this every value has to be calculated independently and therefore we shall write two statements r1 what will be r1 equal to minus b plus discriminant divided by 2 multiplied by a do you agree this is the correct statement and what will be r2 minus b minus discriminant divided by suppose i write this will it be all right please note the difference between this statement and this statement here i have put two star a in parenthesis here i have not put parenthesis please note what will happen if i don't put the parenthesis if i don't put the parenthesis the precedence of c++ says that division and multiplication are at the same level and whenever operators at the same level are encountered they are executed from left to right so dumbo will calculate this divide it by 2 and multiply the result by a which is not what is desired that is why whenever in doubt always put parenthesis and then of course i can say see out good program would you say there are some problems here the problem is that when i go to this my square root function b square minus 4ac may turn out to be zero may turn out to be minus 27.4 how do you define square root of minus 27.4 any idea sorry well whenever you have a value which is negative for b square minus 4ac it should be obvious that the quadratic does not have real roots you then deal with complex number you say that in that situation the roots are complex conjugate roots however we are writing a program to find two real roots of the equation so if b square minus 4ac turns out to be negative then we should humbly say that sorry the equation that you have given me does not have two real roots because i don't know how to handle complex numbers however if the discriminant is positive that is b square minus 4 ac is positive i can calculate its square root and get to the value so you agree that i should do some checking before going to my sqrt which is a function which i have written separately because that my sqrt assistant dumbo will get completely confused he will get b square minus 4 ac as minus 27.4 and then it will apply newton raphson what will happen to newton raphson any idea both newton and raphson will cry up there in heaven the system will not work as simple as that so therefore we should be careful in giving our assistant dumbo only that task 
which the assistant number can meaningfully do. That is our responsibility. Otherwise, we'll get meaningless gibberish from the dumbbells. So that is one issue that we need to tackle. What if discriminant is negative? Or what if this value is negative? There is another problem. After all, I am giving values of three coefficients, A, B, and C. These values could be absolutely any arbitrary value. That is why we said B square minus 4 AC could be negative. What if I give A equal to 0? Well, in actual practice, in an equation A x square plus B x plus C equal to 0, if A is 0, then the equation simply reduces to bx plus c equal to 0 and there is a single root which is x is equal to minus c by b. There is no quadratic. If a is 0, there is no quadratic. However, this nicety we understand because we understand algebra. Dumbo doesn't know algebra. Dumbo knows computation. So if we give a value 0 to our Mr. Dumbo, he will faithfully calculate all of this. b square minus 4ac will simply reduce to b square, whose square root will be b. That is fine. However, when Dumbo tries to calculate this, it will multiply 2 by a, which is 0, and then it has something on the left-hand side, and it will try to divide it by 0. How do you divide any quantity by 0? What is the numerical value that you get? Any idea? Yes, what is any x non -zero? It's divided by 0. What is the value? Ah, but infinity is not a value. It's a concept. Dumbo cannot handle such conceptual entities. In short, if you ask Dumbo to divide anything by 0, it will get confused. It will shout back at you. It can't literally shout, but it will give you some error message. Which means my program will bomb. In spite of the fact that equation is a legitimate equation, only thing it is not a quadratic, but it is a single order equation. Should I therefore intelligently not examine the values of A, B, and C first? If A is equal to 0, I should say not quadratic, single root, which is this. If A is non zero, then should I not examine B square minus 4AC? And if that is negative, I should say quadratic, but with complex conjugate roots, I can't solve these. And only if all other things are satisfied, then should I go with this procedure. Is that not correct? If I have to do that, then I have to use if statements in my program. We will put an additional squiggle in the modified program that we shall now write for calculating the roots of a quadratic. We'll make this program long enough to include some interesting features as well. I will start. This is a new statement. Hash include C math. What is C math? C math is a collection of mathematical functions which our Dumbo has access to. In fact, this C math library, as is known, it comes from the Liga C language. You can also write this as include. math dot h dot h stands for a header file we shall discuss that later but this is the standard invoke if you write this then the complete mathematical calculate mathematical function calculation
sufficient facility becomes available to you. Our C++ number can suddenly calculate square root, logarithm, e to the power something, sine, cos, tangent, everything. Just like we have been trying to write functions, many people have written functions earlier, and some of these have become standard functions which are available to every C++ number. So by simply saying, include CMAP, we don't now have to write functions to calculate sine, cosine, log, exponential, square root, whatever. There are n number of functions. And in fact, if you look at the mathematical library, there is documentation available both online and outside. You will know a series of functions which are already pre-written for us by some people and are made part of the C++ language. So the functions are not part of the C++ instructional language. They are part of the library functions which have been made available. Consequently, I don't have to write a function called my square root. I can simply use square root SQRT, which is a standard function available with math library. So I can use that and proceed ahead. we come across the first condition. We have read in the values of A, B, and C here. And now, as we imagine, we are going to examine first whether A is 0. If A is 0, then what is the meaning? There is a single root. It's not a quadratic. So we will say What is the single root value? Actually, I can insert a statement here if I want. I can actually say R1 is equal to minus c by b and then simply put here r1. That may look better because I have the nomenclature of the root. Notice that I have started this if here. This if ends here. If a is equal to 0, this is what I should do. Else if what? So I'll continue on the next page.
Else, if b square minus 4ac is less than 0, what do I say? You look at the if-else-if if ladder I'm using. If a was 0, I calculated a single rule. Else, if b square minus 4ac is less than 0, I simply announce complex, complex roots. Okay? Else, what do I do now? I can revert back to my earlier computation, discriminant is equal to, this time I will write SQRT. Notice that SQRT is a standard C library function. So I don't have to write this function now. C++ Dumbo does the necessary thing by going to a predefined assistant Dumbo who knows how to calculate square root. And we know that this assistant Dumbo can correctly calculate the square root because b square minus 4ac is not negative. So we will just put the same expression here. And then we will follow. So is this clear? How will you calculate roots of a quadratic? Please note that the if statement which permits you conditional execution and the iterative structures using for and while are the two most important structures available to us for giving instructions to Dumbo. These are called control structures because using these we control the way Dumbo executes instruction. Ordinarily Dumbo will execute instruction sequentially Using these structures, using these control structures, you can tell Dumbo to either conditionally execute this, skip this, etc., or to repeatedly execute something. As an added attraction, when we can provide assistant Dumbos in the form of functions that we write, or in the form of functions that people have already written, which are part of the C++ report I, then our ability to do extremely complex computations increases very rapidly. But we shall see that this is good, but not good enough. There are many other things that we need to do. For example, we still do not know how to handle character string. Suppose names are given, names of student, and I want to arrange them in alphabetical order. How do I do that? Suppose an address is given. How do I break that address into street name, pin code, etc., etc.? We don't know that. Suppose 200 values are given in a matrix, one dimensional matrix, and I have to calculate some average or something. How do I take these values? Can I define A1, A2, A3, A200 variables? Suppose there are one million values which I have to accumulate. Suppose I have to handle a two dimensional matrix and calculate its inverse. Obviously, I will need some additional structures made available to Mr. Dumbo by which Dumbo can store these values. The storage of such multiple values such as multidimensional matrices or a single dimensional array of million values, etc., is available through a data structure called array. That is what we shall discuss tomorrow. Subsequently in the class, we shall discuss more complex structures which are called link list, trees, and so on, which will facilitate our ability to write very good program for solving complex problems. We'll meet tomorrow again. Thank you.